We're live. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of All in Conversations. I got my hero up here today, my grandfather, John Holman, a.k.a. Witch. Made it to the NFR a bunch, taught me everything I know. I thought it'd be fun to get get some of these old stories out. <laughs> Thanks for being on here, Witch. Yeah. We got the man behind the camera is always Ming at Makeline Productions, making the magic back there. We got my two little brothers over here. Go and say hi. <laughs> all right so you made you made the finals in 1970 71 and 73 yeah 72 how old were you when you made it in 70 i think i was 24 i think 24 24 then you're 25 26 what yeah. out of those three years what um what was your favorite what year did you meet sally oh god i met sally in uh uh 70 uh 73 you met her in 73, the last year you made the finals. Yeah. And then you were married to Sally, all the my grandmother, our beloved grandmother, for everyone who doesn't know. Um, met Sally in 73, then married you guys were married to 75. 75? Yeah. And then you met Shelly, which is... Oh, God, I met her 10 years later. Oh, really? 85. It was that long? Yeah. I didn't know it was that long. I was married to Sally for... Nine years, I think, eight or nine years. Yeah, I think, yeah. And then you come on a little comeback tour. What year was that? Well, uh, I was crippled when I met Sally. I had a broke leg, and I was crippled for two years. And so I made a comeback in 85 or 75. And uh, then uh, I uh, kind of quit riding Bronx for a couple of years. I just went to a few rodeos, like 13 or 14 rodeos that one year. The most money I ever come home with was <laughs> that year, because I didn't go to very many. And uh, then uh, I come back in 80, 83, I think. 83, and then you rode for what, a couple, couple I of years? I rode for a couple more years. I quit in about 85. And what year did Joe come around? Joe come around when uh, when I first met Sally. I'd go home with Mike, and we'd put him on Bronx, and he was about 16, 17, and couldn't ride one. Couldn't ride one, two or three jumps, you know. We just about killed him. And and, uh, and then when he was about 18, he figured it out. And then you couldn't hardly, you could buck him off, but the ones he rode, he won first on. Yeah, no, that's what rode I've heard. Really, rode really, really good, really quick. And did you, did you travel with any of them? Oh, yeah, I traveled with Mike a lot, and Joe, too, but Mike I traveled with a lot. And then Sal was just the good-looking sister. Yeah, I went home with <laughs> Mike and met Sally, and I just you know, decided I'd just steal her. <laughs> Got that accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What, um, and when when did Descent come around? I've heard thousands De of stories about... Descent was... Uh, he come around in about 1967 or something like that, and they didn't ride him for four or five years. He was, uh, uh, I mean, they have some great, great broncs now, but uh, he's the rankest horse that I'll ever see. Which one would, what would you compare him to, kind of? Was, uh, was he treacherous? Did he? He was bad as some bitch going. Yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, the, that, uh, What's that rank, really rank bronc that bucks everybody off? Indian burn? Indy, he's kind of like Indian burn, only ranker. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. I wish I wish those old broncs back then, they would have video footage and shit. Now, right. you don't, nowadays, there's you don't get to see any of that. But I just I was at the Survey Ranch teaching that clinic a while back, and the, they have pictures of Descent, and, and they have, it's like they're still, what was that? When did Descent die? Probably... Oh, he died in 85, probably yeah. 86, but uh, Descent was the hardest horse to to uh, get a good picture on. I've never, see, I've never seen a good picture on Descent, because yeah. back in the day, those photographers only had one shot, mm -hmm. and you had to catch him at the right time, and Descent was a pretty hard horse to be right on all the time. Yeah, every jump was probably different. Yeah, and he's he was what made him so hard to ride. He would kick so high and so hard, and he's bad, really bad headed. Really bad headed. Yeah, like, yeah, he rip you down and then pick it back he'd up. He'd root his nose right out of there and pull you plumb to your armpit, and then he would uh, about the third jump, he'd just raise his head up and look you right in the face. Yeah, and then what year did you start traveling with Chris Ledoux? 
Oh, God, when I was, uh, God, it's back when we were about 15. 15? Yeah. And he just, just because he was from KC? Yeah. He moved there, moved to my house and stayed there with me for 10 years. Yeah. At my folks' place. And, and uh, we just started rodeo and we were broke and, <laughs> and poor. And, <laughs> yeah, Sally told me a story once that you guys were so broke that Chris would get, um, get hot water and put ketchup in it and call it tomato soup. Yeah, he'd go in the restaurant and order a cup of hot water and then crackers and put ketchup in it. <laughs> yeah. And they, you know, you hear people talk about roadkill. Well, Chris was big on roadkill. Really? Yeah. <laughs> like a dead coyote on the side yeah, of the not road? Not a coyote, but a deer. <laughs> if he's seen a deer or if he hit a deer himself, boy, he just gutted it right alongside of the road. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you think people... You know, that's all bull baloney about them people eating roadkill. But Chris Ledoux ate a lot of roadkill. That's awesome. You guys got all kinds of good stories. Tell us a little bit about the, um, everybody, a lot of people heard the song Hippies in Calgary, right? When you guys oh, yeah. were up yeah. and went and messed with your buddies down in the hotel lobby. Yeah, there was a bunch of, there was five or six women from Dallas. They call it, they were all school teachers. So they would call them the the Dallas school teachers. Well, they worked more rodeos than I did. You know, they'd just be at Calgary, Cheyenne, everywhere. And at Calgary one time, me and Chris went to their room and we got a bunch of wigs on and beads and sandals and we t-shirts, <laughs> little old skimpy t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> we went to the bar like uh, hippies. <laughs> And, just, was uh, it just the hotel bar? Or did you guys go down? To... We went to the hotel bar, and nobody recognized us. You know, <laughs> we went in, and there was two of our friends sitting there. Old Ronnie Rosen and Leonard McCravey were sitting there, and they kept staring at us. And, and uh, pretty soon, I snuck a cigarette under the table and squished it up like it was marijuana. Back <laughs> in the day, that was a, you know, nobody smoked marijuana yeah. back in that day. And, <laughs> So I drug it out and took a litter up and took a puff of her and gave it to Chris and he took a big puff and and I see him getting up and they come walking over there and and Leonard said to first thing he said to me is I've always wanted to whip one of you stinking bastards he said and uh, well, Ronnie reached and grabbed Chris by this he had a fishnet T-shirt on. And he went to drag him out of the booth with that T-shirt, and it tore, so he went back and grabbed him by the hair. And when he went to jerk him out of the booth by his hair, his wig come off. <laughs> and, but by this time, Leonard McCravey had me just about choked out. Yeah, he was so, behind me and just so choked the, the hell out of me. <laughs> what was their reaction when he went to pull his hair and the hair <laughs> wig come off and he seen oh, it was Ronnie, Chris? <laughs> Ronnie just jumped back and dropped it like it was a rattlesnake, you know. Oh, damn! <laughs> And, <laughs> that's awesome but chris was chris was really fun to travel with because he done something like that every day yeah you know he used to uh carry this makeup kit and he would put big scars on his face and, and make himself look like he was an old old man you know it's, it's a terrible story to tell but one time we were at at, uh, we was at home at KC, and, and uh, Chris was across the street. Nobody knew it was Chris, and he had on an old coat and an old floppy hat, and he's going through the trash across the street. And somebody said, there's a bum across the street. So uh, everybody looked out there, and pretty soon he come over to the bar, and he got come up to the bar there and sat down. Nobody knew it was Chris. And... and uh, uh, so he bought two or three shots of whiskey and he drank them and pretty soon he started acting like he was getting sick you know and he's kind of hicking up and pretty soon he picks his paper bag up and acts, it just sounds like he throws up in this paper bag everybody said oh god almighty and when he set it down on the bar he had a baggie in there a plastic baggie full of uh, beef stew and so when he smashed it on the bar it ran through the sack and started running down the bar and everybody said oh my god and started getting away chris just <laughs> drug it back in front of him like that and started eating it. <laughs> oh shit <laughs> and, 
everybody in the bar was sick. Everybody said, oh, my God. <laughs> but great. the cop had come in and, and uh, pulled his gun and said, get back, get back. And Chris would just growl at him, you know. <clears throat> And so <laughs> I was afraid he'd shoot him, but he never did shoot him. <laughs> Nowadays, you'd go to jail for doing stuff oh, like God, that. Oh, God, yeah, you'd go to jail. Back for... then, you guys you guys got away with anything back then. Got away with everything. I mean, we could... <laughs> so, you... Didn't, you, didn't you take a hippie and cut his hair? Oh, yeah, we cut his hair. I cut his was hair. Was that with Chris, too? No, Chris wasn't there. It was, uh, I forget, there was about four or five of us. And we picked him up in uh, in New Mexico, and he had a guitar. Because every time you'd drive past somebody with a guitar or a hippie, there were a lot of hippies back in them days. Most of them had a guitar. Yeah. And if you didn't have a guitar, you picked him up. And if he put his guitar in first, you just squealed off. <laughs> And you had his guitar, and but this time he got in and then pulled his guitar in. Yeah. So uh, anyway, they uh, he was just drinking our beer and he couldn't play the guitar, and so somebody grabbed the guitar and was playing it, and pretty soon somebody said we ought to cut his hair. I said I'll cut his hair. So we pulled off the side of the road about quite a ways off the road. There's some trees there, and we pulled off there, and. and uh, we got out like we was going to the bathroom, and, and he was right in front of me, and I just tackled him. It must have been a little bitty guy because I tackled him and got him down. <laughs> and so I'm cutting his hair with these, with a pocket knife, and I pulled it too hard, and I cut a little circle off his side of his head there. And he was bleeding like hell, and anyway, we, we left him there and took his guitar, and away we went. And, we got down the road about 50, 60 miles. It was kind of forgotten, you know. We yeah. went off to something else, you know. Mm -hmm. So we stopped to eat, Las Cruces, New Mexico. And uh, when we come out of this truck stop, I don't know where them cops come from, but there was dozens of them. And they all had guns. And they made us lay down on the ground. And I thought we were, uh, I thought they thought we robbed a bank or something. And they threw us in jail there. And, we were there for five or six days, and and uh, I finally asked this jailer, I said, what the hell are we in here for? He said, these other guys, we're just holding them for the hell of it. He said, but we, the charges are on you, and it was uh, whatever they called it, with a deadly, assault with a deadly weapon. Yeah. yeah. I said, hell, I wasn't trying to kill the guy. I just got in his hair. Yeah. Well, they said if you go to when you go to court, if you got the old judge, you're screwed. He's gonna he don't like cowboys, and he's gonna get you. But if you get the young guy, you might get off pretty easy. But he said seven years is easy in the pen. Well, it scared the hell out of me, and and uh, so we went into court, and this judge was older than hell. I thought, man, I'm screwed here. But the hippie won't shut up. Every time. Uh, the judge was asking me something. The hippie kept buttoning in, buttoning in, buttoning in. And, and uh, so the judge got mad at him. And anyway, they found me guilty. And uh, I thought, oh, man, I've had it. And the judge fined me $5 for barbering without a license in the state of <laughs> New Mexico. <laughs> and told me to get out of the state of Mexico. Five New Mexico. Dollars. Five bucks. <laughs> barbering without a license. For barbering without a license. What, what was the time, I don't know if this is true, this is what I, Holly told me this the other day, um, when you went to jail and Benny Binion bailed you out? Who, Benny? Benny, yeah, Benny Binion. That was in Vegas. I can't remember what the hell I was in jail for, just fighting or something. <laughs> but Benny, the way I met Benny was, uh, first time I went to Las Vegas, uh, I was about 18, and I'd never been on a KC hardly, you know. So when I got there, the lights was bright, and the money was everywhere, and the bells was ringing, and so I got carried away. And I, I, uh, I remember I won the first round on a horse called Roly Poly, paid 1,200 bucks. So I got that money, and I lost it. And then I cashed 1,800 dollars worth of checks, and I lost them. Then I cashed another $1,800 worth of checks that I didn't have any money in the bank. And uh, 
So I run into Becky Benny, and that was Benny's daughter, and I was visiting with her, and I told her, I said, I need to, my dad always told me if you give somebody a hot check, if you tell them, they'll hold it for you. So I told uh, Becky Benny, and I said, I got to go see your dad. She said, oh, no, you can't. No, he don't have time for that. But finally she got me up there, and so I went in, and Benny, I remember the first time I seen Benny, he had a six-gun hanging on each side of his chair in his office on a on pistol, like old-time pistols, yep. pearl hand of pistols. And uh, I told him, what the, I said, I cashed, I uh, lost a lot of money here. That's good, he said, that's how I make my living. I said, well, you... I cashed a lot of checks. That's all right, we'll take your check, he said. I said, you don't understand. I said, I don't have any money in the bank. He said, well, here in Vegas, we like you to put the money in the bank before you write the check. So anyway, uh, uh, he told me, he finally said, they, and he had, go I remember he had gold, $100 Buttons. gold pieces, dollars, oh. $100 gold pieces on his vest. <laughs> I remember that about him, and he, uh, I was terrified. I thought he'd just have my legs broke, you know. Yeah. And he said, I'll tell you what you do. You uh, you uh, go downstairs and eat the biggest steak in the restaurant, and then you'd leave, but you send me the money. Well, every dime I won for the next month, I sent to Benny. the horseshoe in Vegas. And anyway, uh from that day, from the next time I checked in there for 25 years, I never had to pay for a drink or wow. meal That's or a room awesome. or anything. That's great. Do you know Benny Benin is Ming? So he explained who he kind of is, which. He was a he was a gangster and come from Texas and had a illegal gambling halls in Texas. And then he moved out to Vegas slowly. You know, they'd move to a little town and start up a gambling deal and and then he started the horseshoe up. Yeah. Johnny Jamie was, Johnson is related. To yeah, he's mar his granddaughter is married to uh, Clint Johnson. Yeah, Jake Finley's um, girlfriend. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Benny Benyon. Vegas wouldn't be there if it wasn't for Benny Benyon. Benny Benyon was really, really a good guy. Mm -hmm. And I carried a an old man around one for two years. He was ninety seven and years old. The first year I took him to the winter rodeos. And he was a hitman for Benny at when he was young. And he'd done some time in the pen for Benny, so Benny took care of him the rest, all his life, you know. And uh, this old man, I wish I'd listened to a lot of his stories, but I was too, uh, too uh, into other things then, I guess. Women. Yeah. <laughs> Bronx. <laughs> Bronx and women. Anyway, uh <laughs> He robbed a bank one time with Frank and Jesse James, and uh, that's how old he was. And uh, I carried him around, and Benny, he'd always, I'd have to call Benny and tell him that Jack needed some money, and he'd always wire it in. But old Jack. I he, love hearing stories about that. That's fun. He was a, quite an old man, old Jack Hart. <laughs> what about, um? is it true that you traveled with, with a bear at one point? Well, I bought a bear. <laughs> I bought a bear in uh, Morris, Manitoba. I was there with, I was flying with Larry Collins. He had an airplane, and there's me and Jim Smith and Tommy Tate and Larry Collins. And uh, these chuck wagon racers had this little bear, and he was only about this tall standing on his hind leg. And I'm a sucker for little pets like that. Anyway, I... So I asked this chuck wagon racer, I said, you want to sell that bear? Yeah. He said, I'll sell him. I said, what do you want? $25. I said, I'll buy it. <laughs> so I bought this bear. Jim Smith said, what the hell are you going to do with this bear? Larry Collins was really tough. He was Floyd Patterson's sparring partner. Floyd Patterson, the mm -hmm. world champion, right? heavyweight. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he was our pilot, and he rode bear rock horses and stuff. But So... I took all my stuff out of my rigging bag and put Jim's rigging bag, and I put this damn bear in my rigging sack. And uh, this bear, when you zipped it up, he's real quiet. He wouldn't even kick or say a word. So we're at the airport out on the tarmac there, and I got my rigging sack. And, and uh, 
So I thought, how am I going to get this buried in there? Because Larry always packed the plane, you yeah. know, and got the saddles in the yeah. right spot for the weight and stuff. So when it come time to load my rigging sack, I just stepped around him, pushed it back in there. And Colin, she turned around and said, ah, damn it, Wetch, don't put it in there. And he went to move it, and his head stuck in this airplane door. And my sack felt different to him, so he... He's looking right at it like this, and he just opened it up like this, and this little bear just stuck his head out. <laughs> I remember Larry reared up and hit his head on the top of the airplane, cut his head, and now he's mad, you know. And he made me turn the bear loose. And I turned the bear loose out there on the runway, and when we took off, I remember this little bear running through the grass heading for the willows. Does. <laughs> he got, you never got him back? I never got him back. <laughs> <laughs> You've always had a thing for animals. Oh, I like them little things like didn't that. He, didn't he pack around an alligator with you for a little while, too? Oh, that was Bill Nelson. He bought this <laughs> damned alligator in Miami, Florida. Or in, uh, uh, yeah, Miami, Florida. And it's my car. We're driving back, and he bought this alligator, and he's about two foot long. Bite the hell out of you. He's, and so we put up with it all the way to... Uh, Angels Camp, California. Me and Butch <laughs> Bray go out that night, and I told Butch, I said, we got to get rid of that goddamn alligator. He's starting to stink. So when we come back, Bill had him in the bathtub, and uh, Butch was teasing him, sticking his finger down there, stick his finger down there. Funny this alligator bit him on the finger. So Butch grabs the alligator, picks him up, and bites the end of his tail off. And uh, so the next morning we get up, and early and we sneak this alligator out of there take him up behind the rodeo grounds there at uh, angel's camp and there was a big nice pond up there <laughs> we turned this damn alligator loose up there don't the ever pond. swim in a pond in angel's camp <laughs> california anybody <laughs> maybe listen i've often wondered what the hell happened to that that alligator i heard a story the other day that exeter golf course down there that back in the day like when Pete was in high school, they would turn, they turn little baby alligators out in yeah. that little pond. Somebody was telling me there was one down here somewhere else. Or maybe it's Holly, on the golf course. Oh really? Yeah, a five foot alligator. Or something Holy one shit! Time. Oh. Billy killed an alligator the other day. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Billy, I never thought she'd be an alligator hunter, but she done a hell of a job. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to a little bit of bronc riding stuff. So, what, um... Yeah, what did you think about the NFR? Yeah, what did you think? You about th the what, what's that? What did you think about this season in the NFR? This season? Yeah. You know, I thought it was good. The horses bucked good, and uh, a lot of guys rode good. And uh, I wanted my my kids to ride better, you know, mm -hmm. but they had a little hell, but it'll, uh, it all turns around. I thought the NFR was great this year just because it was back in Vegas. Mm -hmm. Last year it was good, but it just wasn't the same as Vegas. Yeah. You That's know, true. but the NFR has changed so much, you know, I mean, it's a hell of a it's a hell of a rodeo now, and we thought it was great back then. And when they moved it to Vegas, we were all disappointed, you know, because we didn't think it, Oklahoma City was where it was supposed to be. Yeah. And, but the best thing that ever happened is when they got it, and Benny's the one that got it moved to oh, right? yeah. Las Vegas. Oh, yeah. The reason the rodeo's still in Vegas pretty much is because Benny. Yeah. He, he did it all. He, he was the real deal. And he got a contract for 30 years or 35 mm -hmm, 30 years. years and it or ends, ends this year or something, but I guess they're they're going to stay out there, yeah. I think, Yeah. if I'm, I'm right. How much, since you've been around watching bronc riding, you probably started watching bronc riding when you're 11 years old, what has changed since well, back then and now, besides the saddles? And what, are the horses different? Like the horses obviously? are Horses are, uh, we always had ranked broncs, but just not very many of them. Yeah. You know, we'd rodeo a whole, whole year and maybe get on 10 like they have now at every rodeo you see. So the horses has been the, the big change in rodeo, but uh, these kids uh, riding broncs now, you know, you hear people my age talk about back when they bucked and you know, that's bullshit. 
because I'll tell you what, the Bronx have never been as good as they are now. And uh, the Bronx riders are better now than they've ever been. I'll tell you what, there's 20 guys, there's 30 guys out there, traveler, more than that maybe, that any one of them can make the finals if it just has a little luck with them, you know, because these kids can ride, mm -hmm. you know. Bareback riding the same way. i never seen the bareback riding as tough as it is now. Yeah. You know, but the bronc riding, I mean, these kids anymore, boy, I mean, I don't know whether it's the saddles or... It isn't the saddles as much as it is getting on them them type of horses every day. Yeah. If if you had to pick one bronc ride that you've seen, what what's the best bronc ride you've ever seen? Best bronc ride I ever watched was... Uh, Mel Highland on Reckless Red. Yeah, you've Shia. tell talk to us a little bit about that, right? I've, I've I'll tell you what. Uh, back in the, you know, he rode, he spurred, he rode that horse as good as one could be rode. He just about spurred over. The, back in that day, nobody spurred over their neck. You know, I rode Bronx for twenty five years, and I set my foot on top of one horse's neck in my life, and the only reason I did that is that so much took. Rain plumbed to the cantle. He put his head on the ground. But uh, Reckless Red didn't take that much rain, and, and Mel Highland spurred, spurred him right in the top of the neck every jump. And going into the shoots, if you ever have a chance to watch that bronc ride, when that horse turns and, and is coming right back into the shoots, he damn near spurred over his neck. He missed going over his neck by that far. Really? Great bronc ride. But I've seen some really, really great bronc rides, you know. What year was that when Mel... That was in the, back in the 60s, like 67, 68. Where was it at again? Cheyenne. Cheyenne, that's right. And he'd done it all. He rode a little old low front end Hamley saddle, you know. I'd like to see guys like Mel Highland and, and Joe and Mike and and on these horses today with these saddles. Mm -hmm. That'd be crazy. You know, because... Uh, uh, you know, Joe gets a lot of recognition because he was the greatest, one of his, probably the greatest bronc rider in the world. But Mike Marvel rode just as good. He just rode, but he just didn't have that wing, winning attitude like, mm -hmm. like Joe did. Joe never took a smile off his face, and Mike, he'd punch you in the face. Mm -hmm. You know, he was had a little different attitude, but a great bronc rider. That's awesome. Can you talk, talk more about that, just the winning attitudes? Well, it's uh, the, your attitude is uh, 80% of it, I think. Have a great attitude. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I always had a good attitude to myself, but I never let anybody know I had it. And I don't know why I would be like that, but... I remember Bill Smith telling me, you have the worst attitude in the world, you know, I'd... And, uh, but I didn't. I knew, you know, I'd say to something like to Bill, you know, oh, I probably can't ride that horse or something. He'd say, you don't know, you got the worst attitude, but down deep in my heart, I knew that horse didn't have a shot, you know. I had a, I had a good attitude, but I kept it to myself, kind of. But rodeo's changed so much that it's just a different, whole different deal. Do you, yeah. you like where it's going right now? Yeah, I really like where rodeo's going right now because they're gonna, they're getting more money and they're getting better Bronx and now it's a riding contest. Mm -hmm. Back in my day, it was a drawing contest. You could go to the rodeo and look at the list when I was riding Bronx and I could tell you who's gonna win first, second, third, you know. Yeah. And the rest of us that just had a you no know, one just a shitter, we were riding for fourth and fifth, you know. But the Bronx now, uh, and these kids are, can ride bucket horses, boy. I mean, you 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 know you line them up, the top twenty in the world, and you can most of the time you can't hardly tell any difference. There's four or five guys I really like the way they're riding Bronx, and then there's the bottom ten or fifteen of them guys. It's just kind of a slash, and sometimes they get a little out of shape, and they just keep going fast. But there's four or five guys that set their feet and lift on the rein like it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, there's four or five old school guys out there that uh, 
uh, ride Bronx like we rode them back then, set your feet, and getting in, you know, set your feet in their neck. And there's a lot of them going out there that, that never set a foot. Their feet never stop traveling. You know, that's not riding Bronx to me. You know, you're supposed to beat them to the ground like Lefty. He beats them to the ground every jump and uh, sets his feet in their neck. And his body, his upper body, I've never seen his upper body get out of shape. Yeah, he stays square and lifts on his rein. And uh, uh, that, to, that, to me, sometimes costs him. You know, he'll get on, uh, Lefty will get on horses and they'll mark the horse 19. And one of them guys that snaps his head and keeps his feet going fast and uh, they'll mark the horse 23, mm -hmm. you know, because Lefty makes them look easy to ride. And to me, that's bucking horse riding. That's bronc riding, you know. But there's so many guys out there now that can really ride broncs. Mm -hmm. You like the way that, that one Chuck, he sure rides cool. Huh? One Chuck the, rides good. Does he, he ride like Mel did? Because he's yeah. related to Mel. He rides a lot like Mel did. He's fast with his feet, sets his feet. And Mel was one of the guys back in my day that his upper body never got out of shape. Mm -hmm. Kept his shoulders square and lifted on his rein. And uh, see, lifting on your rein to me is, is uh, 75, 80% of it. It's lifting on your rein. When you get in trouble, you lift on your rein, you know. And there's only, there's just a couple of little things you have to do to lift on your rein. You don't really concentrate on on lifting on your rein. Yeah. If you just turn your hand over and point your point your thumb to the outside, you're you're lifting on your rein, and your elbow drops into the center of your body. Where a lot of these guys get their elbow out to the side of them, and you can't lift on your rein when your elbow's out to the side. But Mel Highland was one of those guys that never I never seen him ride a bronc that he didn't lift. And uh, Joe was like that, and Clint Johnson mm -hmm. was like that. Clint Johnson probably lifted on his rein better than anybody I've ever seen. Yeah. And then uh, there's a little uh, Chinaman from uh, Australia, Daryl Kong, and he lifted <laughs> on his rein and spurred horses in the neck better sure than anybody. Sure his name wasn't Ming Kong? Huh? <laughs> now, Ming, you got to get on a bucking horse. <laughs> got to get on a Chinese bro. guy that can lift. <laughs> I'll tell you what, this Daryl Kong... Daryl Kong might have been the best bronc rider I've ever watched. Daryl, I've been worried. I've been worried about Asian bronc riding because I'm, I might what. have an Asian bronc rider myself one day and uh, yeah. never, never seen one out there. I'll tell you what, Daryl Kong was out there, and I mean, he was a bronc rider. He was, <laughs> and uh, he made it very simple. He just lifted on his rein and set his feet in their neck. He said, "That's all you got to do." Where was he from? Australia. Australia. Yeah. He called me the other day. Thought I was dying, I think, so he called me. <laughs> and uh, But uh, he wanted me to come over there and help him put on a school. He's having a school here in a month or so, but great bronc rider. That's awesome. Is he back in Australia? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. He only weighed about 120 pounds little short-legged guy but man could he ride bronx yeah. never hardly missed a horse out and didn't buck him off very much and just one of them bronc riders you just know that when you first see him he's just got it yeah you know if if um if you could go back in your prime when you're rodeo and what's what's one thing you miss the most about was it the the going to the rodeos the traveling partners just the the good the I'm, good fun times or what was it mr well, as you know, you have so much fun that uh, it's never work, you know. Even when you're drawing bad, you're still having fun. Yeah. You know, but uh, riding Bronx is what I miss the most because I, I, uh, I got to where I didn't like to go. I didn't. It was hard for me to get in the car and go somewhere, but uh, I just like to get on Bronx, you know, and... Even when you have a bad one, you know, they used to 
everybody used to laugh and say, you better buy some stocks and Winston cigarettes because the witch has got a bad one. Yeah, that's, I've heard so many stories about you pace. And I, uh, I'll pace, too. Before I get on, I get real nervous. And, like, Wyatt, my traveling partners, they'll make fun of me because I pace. Um, so you have said to. you pace, too. Yeah, I had to pace. Me if too. I just sat up there and I had to, that was just my way of getting pumped up and, and trying to win something. I'm the same way. I got to move around. I can't just sit on the back of the chutes. Yeah. And uh, Ben Anderson, before he got on Eliminator at San Antonio last year, he's playing he's playing a uh, video game on his phone. And they're re- running in Bronx. Bareback riders are already back in. I'm like, I could not ever do that. See, Joe was <laughs> like that. Joe, he might lay down and take a nap yeah. until they run the Bronx in. <laughs> and then he might not have a saddle or something, and, and he'd borrow shit and still win. But I wasn't like that. I had to get my motor running, you know. Yeah. Do you have any um, suggestions to help make the sport better? Yeah. You know, I don't know. There's so many smart guys out there running this rodeo deal right now that I don't think I would be any help to any of them, you know. Uh, the thing I would change is the judging. Right. The judging is pretty sorry, you know. And uh, the judging right now, they don't have to be accountable to anything. No, that's true. You know, I could judge one tomorrow and just write down anything I want. Lefty could jump out there and make a 15 ride, and I could down put write it down as a 24, and nobody's going to say nothing. Everybody's going to be just like me, getting the car and bitch about it, but nobody's going to do nothing about it. But that's the only thing I could see that they could really change and... and uh, make rodeo better is the judging what what's um one thing you could tell me dawson blaze pistol one thing not to take for granted when you're out rodeoing one thing you look back on and just wish it's gonna go away pretty fast don't take it for granted see and i took it for granted because i just loved to ride bucking horses and i thought that i was going to be able to ride bronx forever and then one day it's it's gone, and it don't take very damn long for it to be gone. What, you know, you, you uh-huh. think 10 years is a long time? Well, 10 years is a blink of an eye. Yeah. What, what's um, one thing that, that um, you, you just miss? Like, is it, is it going down, like, with going having beers or what? Oh, yeah. Just, or the, just getting on the bucket the, horses. Getting on the Bronx, I miss the most, yeah, and, and I... just having fun. Yeah. And I never, you know, you get you get into just a routine where you just get on a bronc, you go to the beer stand. You go to the bar when the beer stand closes, you go to the bar. You do it day after day after day. But uh, uh, just uh, uh, the friendship, you know, is what you, that's the only thing you got when this is all over. Yeah. You win 10 world buckles and they just sit on the counter, they sit on the wall. But it's those guys that when you really need something and you can pick the phone up and, you know, if you're in a bind and need $50,000, you can always find it. Yeah. And, you know, you don't run into a lot of guys like that that you can really count on. But in rodeo, there's probably, I would say in all the sports, I don't know much about baseball and all those other sports, but I know if you have a friend in rodeo and... uh and you need something, you know. Uh, and you just have to make a phone call and yeah. you can get it. That's what a lot of people don't understand. Still to this day, I'll be somewhere in Wyoming, Texas, anywhere. They'll know which or they'll know my grandma Sal. And yeah. they, they'll they give you the shirt off their back in the blink of an eye. That's yeah. A lot of people don't realize that that's how rodeo still is to this day. And it was back then. And Yeah. you uh, You might not see those guys for 10 or 15 years but if you need something and you get a hold of them they'll they'll give it to you yeah it's It's like daryl kong i was just talking about daryl kong if i needed something i could call him and and he wouldn't have the money but he would find it yeah he'd find it somewhere for you and that that generosity kind of goes down like people that knows which they they treat me like like i'm witch pretty much if if witch did something for them Whatever helped them out. They, they was... see, it was that way when I was rodeoing too. I was rodeoing with kids that, uh, with guys that I'd rodeoed with their dad, 
and when they come around you just kind of took them under your wing too and, mm -hmm. you know and uh it's like bradley harder bradley mm -hmm. harder uh you know lefty could need something and i'm sure bradley isn't a rich man but i guarantee you if 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 lefty called him he'd get it yeah he would you know yeah. he might have to sell his truck but he would <laughs> yeah. he would he would get it yeah and that kind of stuff you don't want to ever ever uh, lose track of that you know always keep that in the back of your mind because this and you know you see these guys once they start winning a lot of guys can't take success very good they start winning they become assholes mm -hmm. you know and uh the true guys in rodeo when they start winning they don't like chris ledoux chris ledoux never changed from the first day i met him till he died and uh he didn't have to change after when he died when he went to heaven he didn't have to change to get in there either because he was just a, one of them guys that just lived right you yeah. know done the right thing all the time what's another good story of someone helping you out that that you remember oh god there's so many guys that's that's helped me so much that uh you know, uh, Daryl Collins, John Forbes helped me a lot. Oh, yeah, John, John Forbes could really ride Bronx. And I was a little jealous of that when uh, when I first took him to, I took him to Houston when he was 16. He wasn't entered. And uh, I hauled him to Houston, and I got him to get on some mount-out horses. And then I got him entered in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And... Uh, I was struggling, you know, just barely getting a check here and there. John Forbes was 16 years old, went to Baton Rouge and won every go-round. We got five head there that year. Mm -hmm. He won every round. And he was 16. You know, he was, he was, and he could really, really ride that guy. You know, but all them guys are just, they're good people, and, and I think they are today, but I don't think... Uh, I don't think they're probably as close. There's a handful of guys in the car you're traveling in that are really close, but I've asked guys, you know, hey, this guy, I heard his name, and I see him get on. What kind of guy is he? And they say, hell, I don't know. And when I was rodeoing, you knew everybody. You knew every bronc rider in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. And now some of them guys, I don't think they really know each other until maybe they go to the finals together. Or, yeah. That's true. You know, but uh, just the friendship is what, you know, that's uh, that's what gets you down the road. There's them guys that will just pick you up and take you for nothing. You know, I've been broke thousands of miles from home, and they'll, <laughs> you'll run into a guy that uh, maybe don't even know you that well but knows of you. And hell, they'll just take you and buy you a hamburger. I oh, ain't no shit. Back in the day, Ming, it wasn't like now. Obviously, they nowadays they'll just transfer their money right into our bank account. Right. Back then, they you guys had to wait till you got home to get your money, right? Yeah, unless you stood around and waited for a check. And then, if you didn't pick up your check, you had to wait till you went to another rodeo because they wouldn't mail it to you. Oh, They'd right. mail it to the office at Denver then, and then you could pick it up there at Denver, but. Most of the time, everybody just waited till midnight to till the secretaries all got those checks wrote. Yeah. That's and then you go to Canada, they paid you in cash. Oh, really? Yeah. Did did um? How many times did you go to Calgary? Oh God, probably twenty times. Oh wow, that's a that's an awesome rodeo. See, Man, you got to go up to Calgary one year. See, I think it's a it was a better rodeo then than it is now. You know, when I was, you know, you'd go to Calder, Cal Calgary and there'd be 120 bronc riders, 150 bronc riders. And uh, they had three sections of bronc riding and they filled the chutes every time. So you get on a lot of broncs there, you know. I went there when you get on five head and uh, you had to beat 150 guys. And now you got to be 20. Yeah. You know, but it's still a great bronc riding. Still good bronc riding, but uh, 
Last year was the sorriest I've ever seen it. Yeah, it was bad last year, wasn't it? Horses didn't even talk. Pete. Even Pete, remember what Pete said on Facebook? <laughs> what did he say, Shane? He said, I forgot it was something funny. Well, oh, yeah, I, I'm not going to say it on here, actually. I can't say it. But, um, <laughs> well, hell, they would, you know, they wouldn't even bring enough rewrites to town. Yeah, that ain't no shit. You know, they'd, they'd bring two rewrite horses, and it's pretty easy to give two rewrites and 20 guys if two no. horses stumble. It's crazy. You, you see know. it at the, at the NFR. You see it everywhere, you think. Yeah, you know, but... Uh, it's a good they put on a production now they put on a show now and uh, back then it was rodeo you know yeah so this is like one of my biggest fears is one day when you got to realize enough is enough i don't and hopefully it's in 20 years for me but uh, it'll tell you yeah when when was that for you it was at reno i went to reno and i had a really really good one and uh Boy, this horse really bucked for about five, four or five jumps and then fell down. And uh, then I got a re-ride that was nothing, just enough where you couldn't get a re-ride. And when I got off that horse, I was walking back. I knew I was done. You know, and I was riding pretty good, but I just knew that I'd had enough. I was, I, did, I didn't want to travel anymore, and I drove all night to get there. And I rolled that saddle up, never unrolled it for 20 years. Yeah, until I started getting on. Yeah. You unrolled her. Yeah. You let someone else ride her before I did. I don't know whether I did or not, did I? I don't remember. But that was the first saddle I got on. I, one day when my kid's going to be getting on bucking horses, I'm going to get that old saddle and make him ride in that sucker. Because that, that, them saddles back then, if you made a mistake, you... You had to learn how to ride the bucking horse, not the saddle. And that's where a lot of, I think, younger guys go wrong and teach them clinics. You see them riding their saddle, not the bucking horse. Yeah, and you had to get a hold with your feet. Mm-hmm. And these saddles now will let you make some mistakes. And them old them old Hamleys and Severs and stuff, they weren't very forgiving. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you made a mistake, they bucked you off usually. Mm-hmm. But I, the, I rode that saddle till college pretty yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I remember I never wanted to tell you when I got my a new saddle. I got a G bar G. My dad got me for Christmas one year. I never wanted to tell which. <laughs> I think it's just a good saddle to start in because you have to learn to move your feet. Yeah, it is. And uh, these uh, these saddles now, I'd like to be young and get on one mm-hmm. in these saddles now because they got to feel pretty good. Yeah, you well, you got on. Oh, you got on in Hamley four years. Which yeah. which got on one for everyone that doesn't know. We'll have to pull the video up and add an, a link on here. But he got on one for his seventieth birth, seventy first or seventieth. Seventy, and I rode like I was ninety. <laughs> Shut up! No, <laughs> when he got off, he was walking back to the bucking sheets, and I said, "Good ride, Grandpa." And I uh, right after I said that, I thought no one has ever said that in the history of rodeo. And Good so, ride, Grandpa. Sally said. I said to Sally, uh, I said, I'm going to go home. And she called or something that day. She wasn't here that day. But I said, I'm going to go home, and I'm pretty embarrassed. I rode like shit. And she said, I've seen you ride worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I miss old Sally. Cool. I Call miss me. old Sally, too. <laughs> Sally was, when I was married to her, she made you... She made you ride Bronx or you felt pretty shitty. <laughs> you know, because she had no, it's a good thing she wasn't a man because she'd have beat you. She'd have, rode, she'd have been hard to beat if she had rode Bronx. <laughs> yeah, she would have. Because she had that attitude where nobody was going to get ahead of her, yeah. you know. She was like that till we lost her, too. <laughs> yeah, she was like that when she got old and and not old. She died very young, but... She just had a great, great attitude, and she, uh, she made, uh, she made these kids, made them cowboys, cowgirls, you know, and she didn't give them time to be a. She didn't give them a lot of time to learn. She just put them on there and said, "Keep up," and if they didn't keep up, she went back and whipped their horse till it did keep up. <laughs> You know, but uh, yeah, that's very true. She would have been a great bronc rider if she'd have been a man. Yeah, we would have been out of money. Yeah, <laughs> she would have took all your guys's money. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Pete's uh, Pete's daughter. If she was a, uh, if she was a man, Holly. No, 
Uh, oh, Billy, Billy. Billy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. If Billy Donner. was a man, boy, you better cock your hammer to beat her because she was going to beat you no matter how. Yeah. You know, Bronx, I don't think, would have ever got bad enough for her. She was a winner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Billy was uh, awesome. Uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on the markout rule everyone's been talking about. Well, you know, if they're going to if they're gonna keep the markout rule in there, enforce it, you know. And uh, I don't believe in this. Uh, I see horses jump out that I don't think foul anybody, and they they uh, you let them by the gate. And then I see some guys spur horses out for a good solid jump, and they get them at the gate. And that's what they have to change about the judge. And they have to. It's not going to change until they have the the replay. Mm -hmm. And so you can just take that judge in there and make him accountable for this. You know, like they do baseball. You know, they take them over in the corner and make them watch it again. Once in a while, that guy says, hey, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's the wrong call. Mm -hmm. And that's what has to happen in the judging. Or they have to put up a bond or something, and if they make too many mistakes, they lose it. But uh, that wouldn't be fair either because there'd be so many guys complaining, them judges wouldn't be able to. They'd lose their bond every time they put it up. Yeah, that's true. But... Uh, Something has to be done with the judging. And the stumble rule, uh, when I was rodeoing, they had to fall plumb down. They had to fall on their belly. Yeah, their belly. And uh, nowadays it's you a try little... to get a re-ride and they'd say, he didn't go plumb down. His belly was that far off the ground. But now they just slip or stumble. And I guess it's good if they enforce it right too, but I've seen that. I've seen horses stumble out of there, and they mark them, and then I've seen them just barely stumble a little bit, and they give them another one. Stetson on Wild Cherry the other day, there was 90 points with an option of a re-ride. Yeah. How in the hell does that happen? Mm -hmm. Somebody marks me re 90, I ain't getting on another one. <laughs> hell no, I ain't. <laughs> I ain't getting on one for a week. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to spend my money and to, to hell with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, it's that, uh, that's my biggest concern about the sport is just how you measure it, right? Because I mean, I'm Asian, I need metrics. I like in my head already. I'm like, I I actually want to create some pads so when you when you mark them out, they touch. If they touch it, they won't know automatically. That's why I like. Yeah. Man, we yeah. we even, we would never think of something like that. No, I wouldn't either. <laughs> it but lights up every time you yeah, hit it. Yeah, well, it just, it would just it would just indicate. You, know, and how, you can see how hard you're hitting it, and too. Just leave, just leave the judge, judge, judging, judging the horse, and, and you know, uh, we'll, have, we'll have things that the Cowboys, if, if, if they're spurring them out, if they're standing their feet, you'll, you'll see it on the pads. Yeah. yeah. It won't hurt the horses. I, I think it'll help them. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that will. I'm not, not a horse person, so I don't know if it'll, like, it'll, it'll uh, keep the horses to, you know, stacking up. I don't yeah. Know Know you know, an, another first. thing that mm -hmm. bothers me is that everybody's human. As long as you have a human judging, uh, it's not going to be right because mm -hmm. your idea of, of something is different than mine. Right. You know, we all see different things. You don't think that I see that wall different than Lefty does, but we do. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, But these Bronx, you know, they'll mark them 23. And the other guy will mark him 20. Well, that bronc, you might not ride the same on both sides, but that horse bucks the same on both sides. Yeah. If he's a 20 horse, 22 horse on the left, he's a 22 horse on the right. That ain't no shit. Sometimes you'll see an 18 and a 22. Yeah, and see, that's not right, you know. And if they, if the judges stayed that way during the whole rodeo, it'd be fine. But they don't. You know, pretty soon it'll go the other side. Right. This guy says, man, that horse bucked. He was 24, and the other guy will say, I'm working 19. Right. You know, so it's all going to be different right. as long as. And the only way to change it is have the instant replay yeah. and make them be accountable for it. Just yeah. take them in that room and just say, okay, show me where this guy missed this horse out. Right. Yeah, which. It's only eight seconds, right? Yeah, right. you know, or, or why did you let this guy by the gate? You know, and the stall rule, a horse, when I was going, that horse had to stall. 
he had to stand there for a couple of seconds before, no. you know. And now, I mean, if this horse just does that and turns out of there, they just, hell, he stalled. What, what, what do you think about the drag, too? They're not really emphasizing the drag anymore, right? No, and see, to my way of thinking, drag on your feet, that's part of being a bronc rider, mm -hmm. you know. You know, these guys, their feet just hitting them in the ass and kicking that cantle. Yeah. See, that cantle means nothing to me. I always tried to get kids that I t tried to teach to ride Bronx, I tried to get them to stop their feet quick. Yeah. You know, stop their feet right. For just, back cinch. Yeah, back cinch, and that gives you more time to get back to the neck. Nowadays, All the though. money's won in the neck, mm -hmm. sitting setting your feet and letting them sit there and making letting them judge see them feet in the neck hesitate mm -hmm. nowadays they'll dock you if you don't if you stop your feet at the front cinch or the back cinch they'll dock you they dock joey i seen them dock joey sonier he made a jam up ride in gunnison colorado and they docked him because he wasn't doing the full spur length yeah and see that that's candle meant nothing to me i never tried to kick the candle in my life you know and these guys, you know, they t talk about candle board and one and full stroke and all that shit. I want to see them get dragged on their feet. Yeah. I want their feet to ripple coming back, not just fly back. But uh, it's all changed, I think. I think the saddles have a, have a lot to do with the, the change in, in the bronc riding. You know, and, and they're probably legal. I don't know even what the measurements are. But when I was rodeoing, they measured them at Denver. First rodeo of the year, they had a little jig made, and they'd measure all the saddles. And if they were, weren't were legal, you borrowed a saddle. You know, they wouldn't let you get on with them. They'd make you no. change them. Sean no. Davis won the world one year, and they kicked his saddle out at Denver. Wow. You know. That's crazy. But, well. At this point, uh, Mike Marvel's not listening anymore. Let's hear the story about um, Ekalaka. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's not on here anymore. <laughs> he fell asleep. <laughs> we at Chicago, and Mike gets on this big gray horse called Ekalaka, and he was a son of a bitch. I got on him at Casper one time. He's hard to ride, and he come right around in front of the chutes where it was really, really hard, and... This horse bucked him off right on his back on where everybody had been walking back and forth across there. <laughs> and Mike said, got up, we're standing there. He said, God, let's get our saddles. I don't feel very good. That's somebody's bucked me off hard. So we get our saddles and we'd go to the room, walk into the room. <laughs> Mike sits down on the bed and pulls his boots off. When he pulls his pants down, their hard turd rolls out of his pants. <laughs> he said, God, that son of a bitch did buck me off hard. That's awesome. <laughs> and he, uh, Shit his pants. You know, we'll be, at a, we'll be at a wedding or something. We'll be talking about riding bucking horses back in the day. He'll say, Mike, remember the... Uh, Ikalaka, and he just <laughs> he just stares at you like, don't you bring that up? <laughs> and he'd whip me to this day if he if he hears his story, he'll <laughs> he'll be on the phone saying, "You lying old son of a bitch." <laughs> That's awesome. Anything else you got, Ming? Yeah, yeah, you. Anything you want to? Any wisdom you want to share to these? Uh, this yeah, bronc what riders? what would you tell a young bronc rider getting his permit going down the road? Just don't wait too long and don't hang around the amateurs. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I went to three amateur rodeos in my life, and uh, I won all three of them just because nobody else could stay on one. And uh, I was telling my dad, you know, I won, won this and won that one. Dad said, oh, that's good. He said, you know, he said, you know what I'd do if I was you? <clears throat> I thought he was going to tell me something, you know. I keep going, getting that money and from them amateurs. He said, "If I was you, I'd never, I'd never get on another, go to another amateur rodeo in my life." He said, "If you keep going to them amateur rodeos, you're going to be an amateur, and who wants to beat an amateur?" So that's my deal: is the quicker you can get out there. It's like Lefty when he got his card. 
I said, where are you going to go with your card? I thought he'd think of one in California. He said, Fort Worth. You know, and that's the way you do it. You jump out there because if you, if you hang around the wolves, it's like traveling in a carload of losers. You get in the car and you're the high mark dried all the time. Uh, pretty soon you only have to mark 75, you know, to be mm -hmm. the high mark dried. Where you I always traveled with guys that, and I'd get in that car and be the low mark guy, and I thought pretty soon that you get very sick of that. Yeah. And pretty soon you think, well, this is going to stop, you know. Pretty soon you crawl back in the car and you're the high mark dried. Stay with them guys that are really, really bronc riders, even if you can't beat them, because you'll beat them sooner or later. Mm -hmm. You just keep getting on and and listening to them and. A lot of riding, a lot of learning to ride Bronx is driving down the road listening to them guys that can really ride Bronx. Yeah, and just being a sponge. Yeah, you just sit in the back seat and listen to what they have to say. And it might be some, just some little tiny thing that you'd never think of on your own that will change your whole style of Bronx riding. And uh, see, people that try to analyze it too much and, and think about it too much. Uh, see, I never thought about it. I never thought about, you know, I thought about riding Bronx when they run them in there. And because uh, I've seen guys think about it too much, and they made their best ride kicking kicking back in their saddle back there behind the chutes. Yeah. You know, where if you just, if you have to think about riding Bronx, you're behind. Yeah, you're too late. It's too late. You gotta. It's just a reaction, and and uh, see, I used to watch these kids, and and when they were starting, and and they would say they were trying, they're trying, but they didn't know what try was, yeah. you know, trying riding Bronx. Uh, I can't think of anything else in life where you have to try two hundred percent for eight seconds. You give it every when you get off a of bronc. I mean, you're. Com it, you don't think eight seconds is going to strain you, but you get off one of them bucking horses and you ride him really good. You're completely yeah. out of gas. You're whipped, <laughs> and that's the way it should be, because you're giving it everything you got for eight seconds. And very few, very few guys really, really realize that that it takes that much try. You know, and that's going to win you the world is trying. One thing about this rodeo I don't like is uh, the rodeo count. You're limited to so many rodeos. I don't think that's right. I think uh, part of being a world's champion is knowing how to rodeo, knowing how to enter, knowing how to get there, knowing how to be traded. And I think every rodeo that's sanctioned by the PRCA ought to count, whether you go to 80 or 150. But it, everyone should count. Mm -hmm. That's what I would change about rodeo. It'd be a game of hustle, huh? Yeah. yeah. You know, You know, and everybody said, well, that guy just won the world. Hell yeah, he won the world because he out-rodeoed me. You know, and he rode good and he out-rodeoed me. And that's part of being a champion is learning how to get to him. And, mm -hmm. You know, that's what I would change. The, the judging and I would let every rodeo in the world count yeah. you know the your world titles which uh people who won the world would sure change it would. yeah it would. It would, yeah. It sure would you know i don't know whether there's anybody could out rodeo them right mm -hmm. that's what i was just thinking them boys love the rodeo they love the rodeo and, the, and i don't think they have a lot of money at home maybe i don't know but uh the poorer you are the better you learn to ride you know because you don't have nothing else, you know. And we grew up poor. And when I figured out I could make a living riding bucking horses, you know, I had no interest in a job. Yeah, and I was the same way. You know, a job is for, Dad said, you rodeo because you're too lazy to work, too nervous to steal. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of the way it is. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Heck yeah. Well, thank you, Witch, for being on here. That was fun. Yeah. Do a call to action so everybody knows what likes Yeah, everybody like and subscribe. It means the world's fun to do these, and uh, we got a lot more.
fun ones on the way and coming. So uh, make sure to like, smash, sm is it smash that subscribe button? Smash that subscribe button. <laughs> <laughs>